Bluetooth security keys sounds like a bad idea. Planes could be crashed and zombies are after your CPUs. All that coming up now on ThreatWire. Greetings, I am Shannon Morris and this is ThreatWire for May 21st, 2019, your summary of the threats to our security, privacy, and internet freedom. It's time for a quick shout out and this one goes out to Noah, Justin, The Raptor, Scott, Fabrizio, Redman, Jacob, Larry, James, Lost and Gone, Dr. CPU2, and Steve, who joined the Patreon team this week. I would also like to say thank you to everyone who contributes to my content on alternative platforms over at snubzy.com support, where you can go to support the show directly. So I'll put that link down in the show notes. And of course, as usual, if you want to support ThreatWire on Patreon, that's over at patreon.com threatwire. And now it's time for the news. <clears throat> I told you so. I knew this was going to happen eventually. Everybody on Twitter that follows me knows that this is the case. Heads up, Bluetooth is not always secure. Surprise, surprise. In a post by Google on Wednesday via their security blog, the company issued an advisory stating that there is a security issue with Bluetooth Low Energy or BLE versions of their Titan security key. The Titan security key comes as a USB or Bluetooth version and it costs $50 for the set. They're sold via the Google Store and offer two-factor authentication in one of its most secure forms, which is a hardware physical token. The BLE version of the Titan security key is affected by this bug, which can allow an attacker within a range of approximately 30 feet to communicate with the security key and communicate with the device it is paired with. 30 feet is the standard for Bluetooth usability, so this means that it would not be safe to use in coffee shops or in airports or even conferences or trade events like <clears throat> DEF CON, offices, or possibly even in your own home if you live in an apartment complex. When you sign into an account on your laptop, for example, you need to press a little button on the Titan to activate it. The attacker could connect their own device at that time to the Titan before your laptop connects. They could then sign on to your account if they already had your username and password from some other means, like a recent leak. The BLE Titan security key also needs to be paired with devices before you can actually use it. An attacker could also spoof your key within range and connect to your laptop as a fake Titan key. They could change their device to look like a Bluetooth keyboard or a mouse on your machine to do all sorts of different things. Now, Microsoft alerted Google of the vulnerability and they disclosed it responsibly. Google is remediating the issue by sending users a free replacement key and advises users to continue using the affected one while they wait for a new one to arrive. Google also explains that while this problem occurred, it is still safer to use the key than not because it will still protect you from a remote attacker than just not using 2FA at all because the pairing protocol bug does not affect the cryptographic security of the Titan. To see if you are actually affected, check for a T1 or a T2, which is written on the bottom of your key. These ones are eligible for replacement because they are affected. The company also advises iOS 12.2 or earlier users to only use their key in a private place and unpair it right after use. If you are on iOS 12.3 or higher, affected keys just won't work and you will need to request a new one. On Android, Google also suggests using the key in a private place and unpairing it after successfully logging into your online accounts. Android's newest security patch, which is coming in June, will automatically unpair affected keys. USB and NFC security keys are not affected and can be used with no issues. To request your replacement key, go over to google.com slash replace my key and follow the prompts. This also affects the original manufacturer of the security keys overseas. So for anybody who has a Faceon BLE key, they can use the same directions to replace their own keys as well. Now y'all know that I have never been a fan of using Bluetooth for anything security related, so much so that I refuse to buy a Bluetooth headset for my phone, specifically because the standard is not as scrutinized as others are. If you are looking into alternatives, the USB version of the Titan security key and Yubico's YubiKey options do provide security without Bluetooth. 
Ah, I miss the days where I was heavily obsessed with software-defined radio and tracking airplanes. It was good times. Well, one of today's stories brings back those memories for me. All planes, big and small, use radio to land. This is called an Instrument Landing System, or ILS for short. They allow an airplane to precisely approach a runway with real-time guidance on horizontal alignment and vertical angle during the descent. This is super important at night or in bad weather when a pilot cannot see the runway. Cost and difficulty have generally kept attackers at bay when it comes to hacking radio-based navigation systems, but that's kind of changed in the past several years. Radial signals to and from airplanes are not encrypted or authenticated and were never seen as being a potential vulnerability. And since that is the case, any tones that are broadcasted and read as ILS are assumed to be legitimate. Well, researchers from Northeastern University of Boston were able to use a flight simulator of a single engine plane and a $600 commercially available software defined radio, a physical radio that can be used with a computer, to spoof airport signals that can screw up the navigational systems of ILS in an airplane, making the pilot think that the plane is off course when it's actually fine. A pilot could adjust for the alignment error and attempt a landing, which could make the plane touch down before actually actually reaching the runway, crash into other objects, or a lot worse. Now luckily pilots are trained for this and they would likely do a new approach or visually correct the landing, but the FAA calls for those kind of decisions at just 50 feet above ground, which severely limits the amount of time a pilot would be able to make that choice. And while ILS is definitely vulnerable, the likelihood of this attack is actually kind of minimal. It would be pretty obvious if somebody was setting up an antenna on a plane or close enough to a runway to do this attack. And airports do monitor for interference on their communications. Now, according to the researchers, security issues faced by the aviation community and technology could be fixed with cryptographic solutions, but those would not prevent localization attacks. There is no known way to fix the problem facing aviation and radio at this time. Before we hit story number three, I wanted to say thank you so much to my Patreon supporters. If you are interested in getting access to a whole bunch of extra perks, even if it's just one or two bucks a month, hit that button to become a Patreon supporter because it does help. And it shows me that you appreciate the work that I'm putting in for this show. And a big thanks to our Hush Puppy perk level patrons for sending in their fur baby photos. I love them so much. They are adorable. Keep them coming. Last week, an international team of researchers and academics publicly disclosed a series of vulnerabilities which affect Intel CPUs, much like Spectre and Meltdown did over a year ago. Now, since those two were released, we have seen a slew of other vulnerabilities similar to them be disclosed, mostly having to do with speculative execution hardware found in those modern processors. Well, this month's vulnerabilities are called RIDL, I like to call that riddle, Fallout, Zombieland, and Microarchitectural Data Sampling, hence the nicknames. The flaws allow an attacker to gain access to data that's being processed by the CPU, even from processes outside of their scope. The MDS flaws all have CVEs numbered from 2018 12126, 12127, 12130, and 11091. Intel had well over a year to patch these flaws, and they did work closely with hardware and software parties to implement fixes. Hardware Intel CPU microcode updates and software OS security updates both need to be done simultaneously to mitigate the attack. And if your CPU does not yet have a patch, disabling simultaneous multi-threading or SMT should help. Zombie load is the biggest problem of the four. This one takes advantage of the speculative execution process built into Intel CPUs, which is there to improve speed and performance of the processor. It attacks the load, store, and line fill buffers inside a CPU, and these help make reading and writing data being processed quicker. Zombie load can steal much more information than the other three flaws because it also steals app data if it's being processed in the CPU. So for example, this means that if you are running Tor in a virtual machine, zombie load still steals information about the browser and what sites you are visiting, rendering that security kind of useless. 
browser history, user keys, passwords, even disk encryption keys could be stolen with this attack. Now, if you have an Intel chip, it is likely that you are at risk. Any released since 2011 have the issue, including desktops, laptops, and servers, except for their newest line since those already included the defenses ever since Spectre and Meltdown hit. Microsoft, Linux, and Apple are also distributing OS level patches. And with that, do not forget to like and subscribe to this channel. I am Shannon Morse, and I will see you on the internet.